Lori Houston's News for the Heart is dedicated to helping you give a voice to your own soul. Our hearts have the power to free us from pain and the struggles that keep us from awakening to our true essence. Join Lori now as we delve into our heart and soul to find the path that will open us to the possibilities and lead us to the life we love to live. And good afternoon. This is News for the Heart. And today, finally, I get to talk with Tom Campbell. And, uh, you know, I'm always blessed to talk with Tom because he... He has this incredible ability to take science and make it understandable to me, <laughs> and it's all about love, and that's where we come together. So it's all about the heart, it's all about love, and so that's why I always love having Tom with us. Today I thought we would really delve into his area of expertise, which is on realities and probable realities, and I know he's going to have to explain a few things so that we can understand from his perspective. but. I wrote an article last month, and due to um, a very long, extended roofing adventure, <laughs> we weren't able to do last month's show. But so we're going to talk about it this month. And part of what I wrote was, you know, what if we could tune into a reality where we made different choices? And Tom is going to explain that that might not be exactly how we could do it, um, but let's chat about that so that we can get really clear about what what reality is, what probable realities are, and how we can, I don't know, maybe, I think we can use them because I think we can connect in with those probable realities and see, you know, how different choices affected our reality right now. But let's, let's let Tom take that over and I'll ask questions if I can slip them in on how we can apply this to to our everyday lives. So, welcome, Tom. <laughs> Thank you, Laurie. Always uh, glad to be here with you. Uh, you tend to focus on the applications of my big toe as opposed to the theory, and that's good because that's a very important part of my big toe is that it's not just a theory, you know, to think about and ponder the big questions, but it is something that you can apply to every day, right. everyday decisions to your relationships, to your work, to you know whatever it is you do, however it is you are, it, it applies to that. So it's important to talk about that part of it. And mostly when I go out and talk to people, they want to talk about the theory. Right. They want to talk about you know the big, the big picture theory. So uh, I always like talking with you because we get into the nitty gritty of how does this affect my life? How can I use it to, you know, to, um, be happier, to be a better person, and so on. So, I always enjoy these these, uh, these talks with you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna do um, uh, we're gonna talk about reality frames, and in we are in a virtual reality. So people probably heard me say all this. I'll, I'll just kind of mention it. I won't go into it. We live in a virtual reality. That means we are like the elf is in World of Warcraft. In World of Warcraft, it's a video game. We're in The Sims. It's like the players are in The Sims. That's a virtual reality. It's a multiplayer virtual reality. So there's lots of players all over the planet playing in The Sims or the World of Warcraft at any given time. And each one of the little Sims characters, or the elves in World of Warcraft, are what we call an avatar. And that's the way we are. That's our body. Our body is the avatar in this virtual reality, okay? Now, each player makes all the decisions for what that avatar does. The avatar doesn't do anything on its own, okay? And we are, we consciousness, we a individuated unit of consciousness are the player of the avatar that we call our body, okay? So think of it as our body is in a virtual reality multiplayer virtual reality game and we are the player that make all the choices and all the decisions and of course reap all the benefits or all the consequences you know all the sorrow or all the joy we're the consciousness that uh, is making choices so that in a real brief nutshell is, uh, is the idea of a virtual reality to a lot of people that seems like a really far out idea you know that's that's pretty weird but Science for the last decade has been coming around to seeing reality in that in that very same context. 
that we do live in an information-based reality, which means it's computed reality, which means it's a virtual reality. And the reason that science, particularly physics, is coming around to see it that way is because that's where the experiments are pointing them. That's our, those are the facts of our reality. Every time we do experiments and we try to believe that it is a, you know, a thing that exists in itself, it's not virtual, you know, the matter and the mass and the energy, it's all there and real, it doesn't work out. The experiment says, no, it's not like that. So experiments have been telling us that for almost 100 years. And of course, we've been denying it for that long because we don't like that answer. <laughs> but the evidence keeps piling up and piling up. So instead of just one set of experiments, mostly in quantum mechanics telling us now, now all sorts of experiments from different areas and, and different ways are all pointing in the same direction that this is not a physical reality of mass and energy that exists in and of itself. It's an information-based reality that is virtual. And what's real here is us, us as consciousness, not us as bodies. It's us as decision maker, us as the capability to love or to be greedy or you know, to be however we are, to care, to have fear, you know, all of those things, that's what's real. It's the consciousness, the decision maker, the choice maker, the one that, that uh, is experiencing, that's real. Mm -hmm. This physical context in which we make those choices is computed. All right, that's the general idea that MBT has about reality. And it, like I say, it's being more and more uh, supported now by physics and by, by science. And in another decade, it'll be even more supported. I suspect it will be the king of the hill and it will be the, the, the major idea about reality will be that it's, it's uh, virtual instead of now. It's kind of, it's probably 30% of, uh, you know, scientists probably think it's a good idea. And there's probably another 70% that uh, I'm still in denial and, and I don't want to go there yet because it just doesn't seem uh, right. It's kind of leaving Newtoni, you know, Newton behind. <clears throat> but I suspect in a decade it'll be the other way around. It'll be, you know, the 70% will be on board with virtual reality because it's just better science. You know, it answers the, it answers the mail. It, it turns out to, to uh, be the way things are when you do experiments. So anyway, what that means is in a virtual reality, one of the aspects of it is the reality maintains a database. And the front end of that database is what I call the future probable reality. That's everything that could happen and the probability that it will happen. Okay? Now that's just a database. It's not predestination. It's just a probability. We as consciousness have free will. So we can make choices, and those choices don't have to be, you know, what's predicted or what's expected or what is probable. We can just make some off-the-wall choice that is different than anybody might have guessed because that's what we can do. We're consciousness. We can make choices. And when we do, all those probabilities change then. They have to change for our choices. And all of our choices are done in the present. All of our choices are made in the present moment. You don't make choices in the future. You don't make choices in the past. You only make choices in the present. So our, our game, if you can call it, we're, we're in this game called physical reality, you know, where we make choices. In this, in this game, all the action is in the present. But we have this set of future probabilities, all the things that, are, that might happen, and the probability that they will happen. Some things are more probable than others. Now, one of the neat things about this probable database is that we have some control over that probable future. We can modify those future probabilities, and we do that with our intent. And this is a feedback mechanism for us here. And what that means is that if we really want it to be Cooler, you say it's hot there right now. You know, if you really want it to be cooler, you know, tomorrow, you can use your intent to move the probability a little that it will be cooler. Okay. And that will actually change the probability slightly. 
But now all you're doing, it doesn't mean that you will, you can make it be cooler. You can just change the probability. You can modify the probability a little that it will be cooler. So if the probability is, say, um, a thousand to one that it's going to be hot, which means all the signs are there for hot, right? There's very little else that's forecast other than hot, then you'd have to move the probability a whole lot to change that. If it were, well, it might be cool or it might be hot, we really can't tell, it's right on the edge of either one of those systems could happen, then you're, you're modifying the probability might make a bigger difference, you see? So it, it matters several ways. One, how strong is your intent? Means how much can you move the probability? And how much does the probability have to be moved before it really makes a difference? Because if you bring something that is, you know, a thousand to one down to only uh, 500 to one, it's still not likely going to happen. But you've moved the probability immensely, but it still isn't going to happen because it's still 500 to 1 instead of 1,000 to 1. So it matters how much uncertainty is there in something happening. If there's a lot of uncertainty, then our intent is more likely to be able to make a difference. If there's not much uncertainty, then that means the probability is very high that it's going to be a certain way then it's harder for us to make much of a difference with our intent. So that's kind of how the system works. So when we talk about realities, there are several that we can talk about. There are ongoing realities like the one we're in, which is called this physical universe. Okay, that is a virtual reality um, that I call PMR, physical matter reality. That's this physical thing that we think we're in, you know, with all this hard physical stuff in it, full of mass and energy. Okay, that's one reality frame. When we dream, that's another reality frame. It's our dream reality, and that's a different frame. In our dream reality, we can fly, we teleport, we do all sorts of interesting things we can't do here. Different reality, different rule set. The rule set just defines what can be done and what can't be done in the reality. Okay, our rule set in this physical reality is like basically our science. It's all the rules that say, you know, what can and what can't happen. I cannot jump 20 feet in the air. Well, why not? The rule set doesn't allow it. We're not made that way. Human beings don't have the muscle structure, you know, the weight, the hollow bones, the other things it might take for something of our size and weight and strength to jump 20 feet in the air. You know, we're just not designed that way. So it's not in the rule set. And we, I, should say, I shouldn't say designed, but we didn't evolve that way. Okay? We just didn't evolve to be that kind of a creature. Some creatures can. Some creatures, creatures can jump 10 times their height or lift 20 times their body weight or something. Some can. You know, we can. So that's just the rule set. The dream world has a different rule set than we have. It's not that our reality is the real one and the dream is kind of the pretend one or the fake one. They're just different reality frames that we as consciousness experience in. One's just as real and just as fundamental and just as primary as the other. So it's not like the dream reality is kind of a secondary fake reality that's all in our imagination. It's just a different reality frame in which consciousness experiences. So you're saying if you evolve in your dream world, you're still evolving your consciousness. Sure, because you're making choices. You see, it's all about choice making. And the whole point of being in this reality frame is that we make choices. That's what consciousness does. And we are evolving. We are in an evolving consciousness. And the way you evolve is to make choices that are toward love. It's caring. It's about others, not just about yourself. If you make these kinds of choices, then you as consciousness are lowering your entropy or evolving the quality of your consciousness. That's positive evolution. On the other hand, if we make choices that are all about, you know, motivated by our fear, by our greed, by our ego, you know, it's all about me, we make choices like that, then that's de-evolution. That's consciousness de-evolving and becoming lower quality. So this virtual reality is here for we consciousness to have, cho to have choices. It gives us context for our choice. That's why the virtual reality exists. It's give consciousness a game to play in wherein they can make choices wherein they have feedback and consequences.
So here we are. Our job is to make choices and evolve towards becoming love. That's our purpose for being here. That's positive evolution for us, raising the quality of our consciousness. <clears throat> and as much as we do that, if we are making choices and becoming love, we generally find that life is good, we're full of joy, you know, we're satisfied, happiness is all around us, we smile a lot, and we kind of have this idea that it's a lot of fun being here. If we're doing the opposite, if we're de-evolving, if it's all about us, we're wrapped up in a, in a, you know, in a vision of ourself at the center of our own universe. You know, that's the way we go through life. The way you express that is we're all wrapped up in our own story. <clears throat> then that's de-evolving. That's not going the way we want to go. That's on the side of fear. That's on the side of ego, belief. All of those things are counterproductive to your evolve. Okay, so that's kind of the big picture of who we are and why we're here and the kind of reality is and what's going on. So what's going on is we're here to make choices. We can affect that future probability just by having an intent that's positive. You see, and we notice that. We, notice, we know people who are just very positive. They're just very up. They're smiling all the time. Not that they don't have problems. Not that people don't run into them with their cars or that roofers come and, you know, work on their house for, uh, you know, for two months. Yeah, it's not that things like that don't happen to them. It's just that they're okay with it. It's life. They accept it as just the way it is. They deal with it gracefully and they go on. And those kinds of people are happier. They are satisfied. You know, these are people who are having a good time here, who enjoy life, relationship, and connection. And those people who are on the other side of that, who are de-evolving, and it's all about them, it's all about their fear and their inadequacy and their problems and how everybody else isn't doing it right. And oh, woe is them, you know, people aren't nice to them, people don't do the right things, you know, their relationships don't work because the people they're in relationships with just never carry their fair share, just don't do what they're supposed to do, et cetera. You know, their children are, you know, don't do what they're supposed to do. They get in trouble. They skip school. You know, it goes on and on like that because their attitude is negative. They look at the dark side. They see all the problems. They're full of worry and, you know, they, they feel inadequate, unable to to control their life. It's like life is out of control and it's feeding them all of this junk and they can't do anything about it. And then they get depressed, they're unhappy, they're unsatisfied, you see, and that's the life they live. Well, they live that life because that's the life they create. That's the, that's the probable reality they create with these negative, woe is me, you know, life sucks, everything's so hard, there's so much pain in life, it's just pain, pain, pain and so on, when you have those sorts of attitudes, that's the kind of reality you create for yourself with, your, with the feedback that you get. So we know, we know people that are both ways. We probably know a whole lot more of the ones that are in pain than we know the ones that are in joy. But still, we know some of each of those kinds of people, and that's available to everybody. Everybody can live a life full of joy and happiness and peace and feel good about things. And the only thing they have to change is themselves. They don't have to change anybody else. They don't have to make their spouses better. They don't have to make their kids better. They don't have to make their job better. They don't have to have more money. You know, none of that's important. All they have to do is change themselves. And they can do that. So, and that's sort of what we talk about a lot. So there are these multiple reality frames. And all of them are there for us to do the same thing. And that is to make choices and then grow from, evolve or de-evolve because of the choices we make. Are these cho choices based on caring about others, about love? Are we trying to be helpful? Or is it all about us? Are we trying to make things come out the way we want? You know, are we control freaks? We want to control everything because we know how it should be. And if it's not the way we know it should be, then we're upset and we'll try to manipulate and control and pressure and whatever get it to be the way we know it should be. Well, that's just the way we want it. So it's all about us and what we think it has to be like. And we blame everything on everybody else. If we're not happy, it's somebody else's fault. You know, if we don't have, you know, 
if we didn't get the job, it's somebody else's fault. If whatever happens to us that isn't good, it's somebody else's fault. And uh, we are victims of other people who make our life miserable. And when you go through life as a victim, you're powerless. You know, you're, not, you're not empowered to do anything about it. You're just depressed because you're at the kind of the bottom, you're in this hole, and there's nothing you can do to change it because you're a victim of others. You see? So you're stuck. That's a place that's just totally, completely stuck. Until you own the fact that it's you that's creating this, that it's you and your attitudes and your fears and your beliefs and your ego that's creating this problem, then you can't fix it. Until you own it, you can't do anything about it. See, there's nothing there. If you're in denial of it or don't know about it, how can you change it? You can't get any traction on it. So you go to classes and you go to retreats and you learn how to meditate and you do yoga, you know, and you, you know, put positive slogans on your refrigerator and repeat them and you do all these things and it doesn't work because you still haven't owned the problem that, you know, that you have to change yourself. So we have, we have our reality frame that's physical, our dream frame. There's a frame that we end up in after this avatar dies. In other words, our body dies. We end up aware in another frame. It's called the transition frame. There are other physical realities like ours. We're not the only, you know, game in town. It's not like you either play World of Warcraft or you don't play, multi, you know, multiplayer, uh, multi, you know, virtual reality games. There's dozens of virtual reality games out there. And it's the same with us. This physical universe is just one game that's going on, and we're logged into it. But because we, we grow up or grow down based on our choices, we have also a dream reality because there we have a different set of choices. It's not the constrained set that we have here. In this physical reality, we're strained by a very tight rule set. In the dream reality, all kinds of other things can happen. All sorts of associations, all sorts of temptations, all sorts of problems and situations. It couldn't happen here. And that gives us a whole different set of choices we get to make and a whole different way of caring. But it's still the same thing. Are they caring choices? Are they choices about others? Or are they choices about self? You see? Are they based on love or are they based on fear? Well, it's a different you know, it's, it's different because the dream choices are often very dramatic. And another thing that's different about the dream reality is that in the dream reality, you don't have your, your usual intellect that tells you not who you are. In other words, you don't act here in this physical reality. You act how you think you should act. You have a story. And you act according to your story and who you are and what you think you should be. So if you see somebody that needs help, you may decide that it is the thing I should do is to go help them. And that's good. But that's entirely different than you see somebody that needs help and you just help them because that's who you are and what you do. See, so one's coming from the intellect. I think I should do this. That would be the right thing for me to do. And the other one is you just do it because it's you. It's who you are. See, two different things. Now, when you go to the dream reality, that, that intellectual version of you doesn't come along. That stays, that's, that stays in bed, okay? And you, at the being level, who you really are, that's the chooser when you're in the dream reality. Whereas here, in this physical reality, the chooser is mostly your intellect. So we, in this reality, can trick ourselves all the time. That's how it is that when, you know, our life sucks, we say, it's somebody else's fault. You see, that's your intellect excusing yourself from responsibility. So we do that all the time. So we don't actually see the world the way it is. We see the world the way we want it to be. We see the world in terms of what we want, what we need, what our fears are. That's the way we interpret the world. And in the dream reality... You interpret it straight from the being level. You interact how you are. So if you're in a dream reality and you do some things that you come back later and say, well, that wasn't very nice. Well, that's you. That's you at the core. Here, you would never do that because your intellect would come in and say, no, you know, that's not appropriate. Don't do that. But that's not really the way you are. That's just your intellect 
overriding the way you are, you see? So that dream reality is really a very nifty kind of reality because there's no hiding there. We always react and interact the way we are fundamentally at the core. So that's a neat thing about it. That is neat. So, so, so dr our dream reality is a very valuable reality. Now we can do other things. We can do what's called out of body, which basically isn't really out of body. It's just hooking up to a different data stream and, and experience other reality frames. There are many, many reality frames that we can go experience besides just this one. And you do that by detaching from the data stream here. What that means is you just let go of all the sense data so you don't feel, hear, see, smell, taste, anything here. You just let all that go and then you can attach to some other data stream that defines some other reality. It's just as simple as that. You know, it's a real easy thing. You're not really getting out of your body. You're just your consciousness. Your body's virtual. It has nothing to do with your body. All you're doing is, is taking your intent and connecting to some other data stream as opposed to the data stream that defines this game. It's like you're disconnecting from World of Warcraft and you're connecting to Sims. You know, it's that sort of thing. There are these two reality frames that are separate from each other. Sims and, and World of Warcraft don't connect. The players never interact. Two separate reality frames. But you can play both. You can connect to one or you can connect to the other. And eventually, with practice, you can connect to both. And you can have a you can have player basically in both games if you like. You can you can do more than a, than one reality. But that's kind of more of an advanced case. You know, mostly you just play one game, right? Most of us just play either World of Warcraft or we play The Sims, and we stop playing the one if we're going to start playing the other. We just do one at a time. Um, so that's also a nature of reality. The next thing about realities is not only do we can we change them with our intent? But we actually create our reality because of our beliefs, our fears, our egos. We interpret the data we get. So the, no two of us live in the same reality. It's similar, right? We all know where Toronto is and, you know, and Boston and those places. And we can meet at certain places there. So there's some similarity in them. But they're not the same reality. Everyone that hears me speaking right now is interpreting it in their own way mm. to mean things to them. And every time you talk to one of your clients, they don't necessarily get exactly what you're thinking and what you're saying. They get how it affects them. They get their interpretation of what that means in terms of their own history, their own love, their own fear, you know, their own ego, you know, or their own experience. So, they get something based on their experience base. You tell them something based on your experience base. They interpret it in terms of their experience base. Everybody lives in their own unique reality. That's why five people seeing the same accident from the same street corner put in five different accident reports. None of them are the same because they all interpret what happened differently. They all see different things. There's some things that some people pay attention to and other things they just don't. They just miss and vice versa. We all connect in different ways. So we get this data stream, which is all our sense data, all of our five senses. This is our data stream. We interpret that data as this reality, but we get to interpret it. It's our own personal interpretation. So you see, you can never share an experience with somebody else. You can only share a description of that experience. And the other person then takes that description and converts it into, you know, their own viewpoint. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it is. So one thing that we can do to change our reality is change the way we interpret it. When you're a victim, you interpret your reality as everybody else is doing stuff that is difficult for you. You know, you're, you're always at the short end of the stick. Other people Make your reality bad. So you're a victim. It's not you. It's other people. And they make your reality that way. You know? So all the people in your life, and it doesn't matter whether it's the person that sits down on that bus seat that you have to stand now because they sat down. And, you know, they're only 18 years old and probably could stand up. And your feet are just aching, you know, because you're 50 pounds overweight. 
and you can't stand up anymore, and that person just makes you mad, you see. Well, we always blame everything on everybody else. It's not your fault that you're 50 pounds overweight and that your legs hurt. No, it's not having anything to do with it. You see, it's that person who is making you suffer. So everything is somebody else's fault. Everything in our life, all of our pain, we can say, you know, that that pain is caused by somebody else other than us. Okay, so that's that's the kind of reality you can make for yourself if that's the way you interpret things. You see? If you interpret things differently, then you don't see it like that. You see that you are empowered to make choices and that you can choose to be upset or choose not to be upset. You can choose to ask that 18-year-old, would you mind moving and letting me sit down? My, my legs really hurt. And you can say that in a nice way, not in an angry way, like, why don't you sit in my seat, you know? Can't you see, you know, I'm an old lady standing here, and, you know, you sit, you young kids don't have any respect, you know, and you go into that, you see, then generally they'll look at you and ignore you because you're not really communicating with them. You're just a grouchy old person. So if you really can talk to them, because you're not upset with them, you're not angry, you realize they don't really look around, they don't see that you're standing there suffering, they don't, they're not aware of any of that stuff, and if they were, they wouldn't mind being helpful to you. And if you ask them in a nice, polite way and so on, it is respectful. And accept that if they say no, it's okay too. Then you'll make it. You'll get through. You see, if you have that kind of attitude, then when you get off the bus, you're happy. It's been a good day. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, when you get off the bus, you're upset. You're angry. You know, and it's your choice. You get to make the choices that decide, are you an angry person or are you a happy person? Do you live in joy and peace or do you live in pain? Your choice. So in that way, we make our own reality. We create it in some sense by our choices, by our attitudes, by the way we interpret the data. So that's another reason when I say that if you... You know, if you just take responsibility and you're not a victim and you have a very positive attitude, life gets better. And it's not so much that anything else changes outside of you. It's just your perspective. How you interpret that life gets better. And that works to the degree that people can't upset you. You're almost impossible for you to get angry or upset or annoyed with anything, you see. And people like that are very happy, satisfied, and enjoy life. They're at peace. They don't have a lot of pain. Not that things don't happen to them, but the way they interpret them, the way they live with them, and the way they deal with them is positive. It's empowered. They're not victims, you see? So that's, that's just the difference. So yes, this reality isn't something you're stuck in. This reality is something you create to, the most, you know, to, to a very large degree by your interpretations, by your intents, changing the, the future. Uh, probabilities. Uh, and of course, you came here in order to make choices. This was a place that you were going to evolve in. You came here to make these choices. And you are either succeeding at making good choices and evolving, or you're not succeeding by making poor choices, or maybe as many good choices as poor choices. So you're just kind of languishing in the middle, not really de-evolving, not really evolving. You're just in the stew down there, you know, which is where a lot of most people are. Uh, or you're making really poor choices, and you're and you are de-evolving. You know? So those are that's just the way it is. But that's the way the game's played. You come here to make choices, and you have free will, and nobody else makes your choices for you. you know, people get uh, it's kind of wrapped up around this idea of free will, and they say, "Well, I don't have free will because I can't do what I want." Free will doesn't mean you get to do what you want. Free will means that of the choices that you do have, that you do know about, you have the free will to choose one of them. Okay, so you can choose whether to be angry at that kid for sitting in that seat just before you got there, or you can choose not to be angry with them. Your choice. You do have that choice. So if you exercise that choice, then you're a happy person. And you probably will get to sit down. If you stand there and glare at them and grit your teeth, you know, they'll kind of shrink 
in their seat a little bit, but they're not going to get up because they don't understand the, the situation. They don't know what's going on. They don't see it the way you do. Your reality is not their reality. They live in a totally different reality. And in their reality, you're not somebody standing there, you know, with painful, you know, legs that uh, need to sit down. It's just somebody who stands there, and sometimes they stand, and sometimes they get to the seat first, and that's just the way the world is. They're not thinking of other people. They're thinking about themselves, you see, because most of us are full of ego and fear and so on, and we just not tuned into other people. It's all about us. Well, he got there first. There's a seat. Stand up. You know, that's what he does. Somebody else gets there first, he stands up, he doesn't, that's all right. And that's the way he sees the world. So we think that everybody else is just like us. That everybody else is the same as we are. You know, if that would make me mad, then I expect it'll make you mad. Yeah. If that doesn't make me mad, then I'm surprised when it makes you mad. I don't understand, you see, because we expect everybody to be like us, which is the, <laughs> the big problem between the men being from Mars and the women being from Venus. You see, they don't understand each other because they each expect the other to act the way that they would act. Mm -hmm. Oh, if that was me, I'd clean that mess up. I, you know, I wouldn't throw my clothes on the floor. I would, you know, do this with the dogs. I'd do, I'd do these other things if that was me. But from the other person's viewpoint, they wouldn't. Eh, that mess is, yeah, it's a little mess, but it's not really big enough to clean up yet. I'll wait until it accumulates a few more dust bunnies, and then I'll clean it all up at once. You see? <laughs> That's somebody else's reality. <laughs> and you have, you, know, you have to realize that other people are not you. They don't see things like you. And you think that everybody should because the way you see it, obviously, is the right way that it ought to be. And you don't understand then that when you, you demand that other people do it the way you want it done, you're basically jumping into their game and demanding that they do things the way you would do them. That's, I'm in charge, I'm superior, I know what's right, you're a screw up, you don't know what you're doing, you need to obey me and do it the way I say. Well, nobody likes people like that, <laughs> that try to get in and, and, and tell them to be other than they are. Then you get pushback. And then when you get pushback, even if they do what you want, it's not good because now there's trouble, there's tension, there's space there, and, and it's not good for the relationship. But if you can look and just realize that people see things differently and go with that flow, and you can ask and you can try to explain your point of view and maybe people sometimes will say, you know, you're right, you get a good point. We should do it this way. And maybe they won't. And maybe sometimes you have to say, well, okay, it's the way you are. I accept that. You know, I can deal with that. It's not that big a price to pay for, you know, for the other things that, that are good in the relationship. So you have to be able to understand that your reality is personal. Your reality is not the right one. <laughs> your attitudes are not the right ones. You know, it's, uh, it's personal. It's just yours. And other people don't see it the way you see it. So that's another you know, thing about, about realities. Uh, you, were, you were mentioning that we can sometimes get into these other realities to kind of see a bigger picture of our possibilities and where we might go. So, so we have all of these choices at all different times, and yes. when we make all of these different choices, we don't always see mm, how it sort of clicks into the reality that we're in. And I think, I think it could be very empowering if we could sort of take some time, maybe do some meditation around it, kind of maybe go into those different choices that we could have made, we could have made differently, and maybe see how that might have changed the probable reality that we are experiencing now, and maybe help us to sort of, I don't know, make different choices to just to sort of see, like, every time, you know, we do get angry, or we do, because, I mean, that kind of brings in the karma aspect of it. Like, when we, you know, when we have our own definitions and our personal perceptions of how things are happening, and even though, even though a whole bunch of people would feel justified in giving the same reaction, again, like you said, it doesn't mean that it's a, the right reaction. It just, it just, it's based on your own 
personal definition and your own perception of what you're seeing as happening. So, right. you know, ultimately, obviously, it's, you know, to choose love over fear. Mm -hmm. it, but it's like sometimes there's so many different varying degrees of that, and sometimes it's really challenging to not get triggered, to not, you know, to not get angry, to not, but if you could, if you realize that every time you get angry, you're creating more, and I'm not going to say negative karma, because it's not really about that, but it is the effect of what you're creating. Like it, yes, it is. Thing you understand that each time you get angry, you're actually moving into that vibration of fear and not love. So it, it tweaks your karma. It, it, it needs to show you that you haven't healed this. Like that's, that's really what the, our consciousness is all about, right? It's, it's about helping us see the choices we're making and in evolving towards love. Right. And that is correct. Every time you get angry, you raise the probability of living in a, in a, in a world that makes you angry. Right. You, know, you increase the, you know, you move into that dysfunctional space more. So every time you get angry makes it a higher probability that you're going to get angry again. Yes. You see? So then now you get angry twice as much as you used to. So now you're going to going to get even angrier yet. Then it's four times more than you used to. And it just, it just keeps doing that until, of course, you hit bottom. And then you're this depressed person. You know, you're angry at the world. You're angry at everybody. And... And of course you're justified. You're, because oh, of course you're justified in your own mind. You're always justified. <laughs> and if you can't justify it, you deny it. I mean, those are your choices. Either justify it or deny it. Yeah. So, of course. And the thing that a person needs to do is first take responsibility for their life. If I'm not happy, if I don't live in a world of peace and joy, I'm responsible for that. Right. That's the first thing. And that'd be hard for most people to do that. You know, if... If your life isn't a happy life, you are the one responsible for that. Nobody else is in charge of your happiness. And that doesn't mean that you, you need to now make the world, you know, the way it ought to be. That just means that you need to find choices other than the ones you're making. You need to see things other than the way you see it. You need to interpret differently. And one way to, to do that, to approach that, is when you feel these negative things coming on. You feel you're getting angry. You're getting upset. Your feelings are being hurt. Oh, this isn't the way you wanted it to be. Or this is not, you know, I went to the store. I went all the way to the store. Now they didn't have what I want, you know. And now you're <laughs> aggravated because you spent all that time and money and you got there and they don't even have it, you see. But instead of having that idea, of course, you could always interpret it differently. You know, okay, you did invest that time and that didn't work out, but that's okay. Maybe there's something else over on the side of town that you really, you know, could do while you're here, you know, or maybe there's somebody to see over here that otherwise you wouldn't have seen that you could stop in, or maybe it was just something else to do today and maybe you'll just get it tomorrow. You know, it's just the way it is. Life always doesn't work out the way you expect and that's okay. You know, tomorrow's another day and also that, and it just works out differently. You say, well, what other choices can I make? And of course, because you are full of fear and ego and belief, you'll think about it and you'll say, I can't make any other choices. This is just the way I feel. I'm upset. I'm angry. I don't see it being any other way. Well, you've got a point there. And then what you need to do is say, well, what is this fear? Why am I angry? What is it about this that makes me angry? And you'll find out, well, it's because I didn't get my way. I thought I was going to come over here and do this thing. And now I can. I didn't get my way. That's why I'm angry. And then you can say, well, maybe there's something wrong with being angry every time you don't get your way. Isn't that a bit self-focused? And you would probably say, yeah, I guess it is. It's all about me and my way. And if I don't get my way, I'm not happy. And that should give you a place to start working on a fear that you have. That, that fear probably has to do with something like being uh, inadequate, not good enough. And in order to whitewash that fear, you have to be superior. You have to be perfect. You have to be 
you know, always right. Things have to work. You always know how it should be. And you kind of build that up in yourself because really you feel just the opposite. You feel small. You feel inadequate. So in our response to our inadequacies, we make ourselves up to be one of two things. We're either, you know, better than real life. And then everybody should pay attention to us and do what we do and do what we say because what we say is right. It's the way everybody should be. So we become one of those people who knows, not only knows it all, but knows the right way that things should be done, you see? And the other way we can react to being inadequate is to do just the opposite, become very uh, meek and kind of a drop out, not be connected with other people, kind of stay at home, suffer in silence, you know, be a martyr. Uh, you know, there's all, that's, that's the other side of the choice where you can be. So you can either kind of puff up and demand that everybody do it right, which is the way you want it done, or you can shrink down and be a, a, a martyr and, and uh, you know, kind of live the life of everybody else's floor mat. And, oh, woe is you, you know, and, and kind of live in that kind of, that kind of a space. And both of those spaces are equally unhappy. Both of those spaces are equally full of pain and misery. So what do you do is you get rid of the fear. So ask yourself when you feel that negativity, anything, upset, stress, anger, annoyance, all of those things are negative. And when you feel that, say, why? Why do I feel that way? And if the answer comes back, because they're not doing it the way I want, because they didn't have the thing the way I wanted it, well, think about that, you know, that you, it's all about you. Everything's about you, the way you want. They're not doing it the way you want them to do it. And realize that that's the problem. It's you needing them to do it the way you want them to do it, rather than letting them be who they are and doing it the way they want to do it and accepting that, dealing with it, and interacting with it. It's not that you just have to accept everything that everybody is. You can go up and say, you know, I'm an old person and I'd really like to sit down there. Do you mind standing up, young fella? And they will probably say, well, yes, sir. <laughs> and they'll jump right up. So it's not that you can't interact with it. It's not like saying, you know, I'd rather, I could live in this house more comfortably if you pick up your dirty gloves, you see. And that's a fair thing to say. And they may agree with you and say, okay, I'll try. But maybe you know, it won't work because this is not the way they are. They don't see dirty gloves. They, it, doesn't, it doesn't make the house less livable for them. And you might tell them again, you say, you know, this is something that bothers me. And they may try to do that. But you may find out that it's just a whole lot better to pick up the dirty clothes yourself and be happy rather than to stare at them on the floor, complain to other people, and be miserable, you see. So it may be, well, okay, it's just not that big a deal. I don't like all the dirty clothes all over the house all the time or the unwashed dishes or whatever. So I'll just wash them. It's all right. And then my house will be the way I like it, and I'll take care of it. Instead of, it's unfair, you know. I have to pick up all the dirty clothes. Right. I have to do, I, 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 you see, all the way that it's not the way you'd like it to be, and it's all about you, just do it. But do it with grace. Do it with joy. This is part of the things that you can contribute. Other people contribute to things they do. Other people contribute to the, you know, to what's going on. And maybe what you contribute is to do the dishes and pick up the dirty laundry. That may be a way you contribute. And you say, yeah, but I contributed this much and they only contributed that much. So I'm not, it's not fair. You see, well, this thing about fairness is just ego. There's no such thing as fairness. If you're worried about fairness, that's your ego. So you just let that go. And if you don't have a time in the day because you're so busy to pick that up, well, maybe you only pick it up every other day. Or maybe only on weekends. But you live gracefully with that and you say, that's how it is because I'm living with other people. Other people have their own ways of being, their own ways of seeing things, interacting. And I have to let them be and I'll be me. So if it's my requirement that the house always be picked up, then I'll pick it up. And that's okay. But you see, that's different. Picking it up and being okay and doing that gracefully because it's part of your contribution instead of picking it up and being angry because you've done more than somebody else, you see. 
that's a problem. That's then looking back at you and saying, oh, poor me. Look, poor me. I'm abused. You know, I don't have to take this abuse. I'm better than that. You know, it's all these people. And then you work yourself into the situation of pain and misery and unhappiness and the rest of it because it's all about you again. If it's about others, then you don't mind doing things for others. If it's about you, you resent having to do things for others because it's all about you. You see, that's so we create our own reality to a very large extent from our attitudes and our choices. And we need to change us. We need to change us how we see the world. And part of the way of doing that is asking yourself, you know, how else could I respond to this? Why do I respond to it the way that I do? What other choices could I make? And you might say, well, okay, I don't like the dirty laundry on the floor all the time. I can pick it up. And your next thought is, yeah, but I don't want to do that. That would be unfair. I would be, in, you know, I would be abused if I did that. You know, I pick up mine. Everybody else has to pick up theirs. And then again, you'd have to say, well, yeah, that's all about me and what I want, what I need. Well, the world and the universe isn't about me. It isn't about you, you see. There's other people in this world and this universe, too. And if they're normal people, like most of us, it's all about them. That's the way they are, you know. It's all about them. It's all about you and your ego and their ego is having a clash. And they want you to be the way they want you to be. And you want them to be the way you want them to be. And that's just pain and misery forever, you know, for everybody. It doesn't work. You have to give and not worry about what you get. You give and you just do what you can do. So you pick the stuff up. You wash the dishes. You do whatever needs to get done. You, you know, whatever it is, you just do it. And you do it gracefully. And you do it happily. It's your part. Some way that you can give to the situation. And that that's a good thing. You'll like yourself better and everybody else will like you better too. And no, you won't be an abused person. Because people will realize, wow, so-and-so, they're really doing a lot, you know, and the house is always picked up, and the dishes are always clean, and actually, you know, I kind of like that too. I really like that kind of environment. I really appreciate what they're doing. Right. And that's okay. And maybe they do other things. Maybe they, you know, whatever. They have their own contribution. Maybe they change the oil in the car. You know, maybe they, you know, lift heavy boxes. Maybe they, you know, do other things. Maybe they clean out the attic or, uh, you know, who knows. But that's just the way it is. We do what we do. And if it's not, if the person you're in a relationship with is just totally unacceptable because they have things that they do that you just cannot live with, well, you probably ought to start looking around for a, you know, for a change in your, in your life because that's not working. Just being miserable isn't a good option. But often, you'll find that if you change, if you grow up, some miracle happens and they happen to change too. Because the reason they are the way they are is partly because you are the way you are. And when you get angry, it makes them angry. And then you fault them for being angry, you see. But you're a contributor to that anger, to that dysfunction, <coughs> to that desire to just throw your stuff around because that's the way you get back. So that's kind of the miracle of the way it happens. <coughs> Excuse me. Is that if you do just give to the situation, you'll find that everybody else gets nicer as well. Yeah. Don't worry about, oh, but if I do that, I'll just be abused. Just do it and see. See how that works out. And if you are really abused, then find another situation. Get out of a situation where you're abused. But you'll find that mostly being abused is in your own mind. Mm -hmm. Being abused means that things aren't happening the way you want them to happen. And if you can get over that and give rather than worry about what you're getting, you'll see that a lot of the things that now annoy you just disappear. Mm -hmm. They're not there anymore. Other people are friendly because now, before you were angry, they were angry in reaction to you and you in reaction to them. You're nice. There's nothing to about that that... It urges them to be angry. So they get less angry just because you did. They get less angry. And as they get less angry, then it's easier for you to even give more 
and they'll get even less angry. And pretty soon you're working together because you're both doing the things that help the whole, that help the both of you doing them and doing them in your own way. And the other person gives the other person the ability to be themselves, but just supports them in other ways. And it grows and it actually works out very well. So this idea that, well, if I just did everything, then nobody else would do anything. And, you know, I'd be the maid, you know, the bottle washer, you know, I'd be the butt of everything and just be abused. It probably wouldn't work out that way. That's your fear. That's your fear that's telling you that. Just try it. Try it and give. Yes, it takes a while before people change. You may have to do that for six months or a year before kind of people say, hey, I, this, she's different or he's different now. You know, give it, give it time. And if, it, if you are not angry and not upset, but doing this out of graceful desire to give to other people, you'll find that you're not so upset with it. It really doesn't matter who does what or how much you do. You're part of the everybody's solution, and that's okay. It's not about if I work an hour, somebody else has to work an hour too. And if somebody else goofs off, I need to goof off too. That's all about you, you see, and that's your fear that somebody else will do something to you and you won't get your fair share and all that fear. Let all that fear go. And then it really doesn't matter. Put a lot of energy into, you know, whether something's fair or not. And then, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah the, I, there is no such thing as fair. Like I say, fair is just ego. ego. There's nothing, if you're concerned about fairness and, and you think life's not fair, that's just your ego and your fear. That's very, that's a self-focused viewpoint. What's, what's fair and what's not? All about you. It doesn't matter whether it's fair. Fair doesn't mean anything. How much can I give? How much can I be helpful? What can I do to make other people's lives easier? And if you make somebody else's life easier, that makes you feel good. It's not that I got, I got my share makes me feel good. See, that's not, that doesn't work. It's what I can give to other people makes me feel good. Then it doesn't matter that you are the only one that ever picks up the dirty laundry and the only one that ever washes the dishes because it's what you do. It's what you give to other people. It counts. And they will want to give things to you too because of what they're getting from you. They'll want to reciprocate with that because they will appreciate it. And if they don't appreciate it, well, you just keep doing it too. You're not doing it to get their appreciation. You see, then it's about you again. Mm -hmm. You're just doing it because it's something you can give, something you can offer. And if it is truly that, you know, if you are truly abused, well, then get out of that situation. Go find a situation that's better. But if you only think you're abused because things aren't the way you want them to be and people aren't the way you want them to be, then take responsibility creating your own reality. That's the way it is 90% of the time. Most of the time you are, you are a very large part of what you blame on other people, you know, because every time you're unhappy, you don't think it's been done right. Somebody else knows that you think that they didn't do it right. And it annoys them. You see, and now that, that there's this, thing between you now that's in this relationship and to try to decide well who's at fault and who created it first you know that's not a, that's not useful the point is just to let it go and just be positive how can I contribute to other people's happiness and as you do that feel good about it now you're a, now you're a happy person there's joy in your life there's peace in your life because you're helping other people you see, if you see it that way, then it's hard not to have joy in your life because it's not about what people do to or for you. It's about what you're able to do to and for them. So you're totally in control of your own happiness. You see, it's not like your happiness depends on them giving you this or them doing anything. Your happiness is totally self-contained and it just depends on you being of service to others. And that does not make you a doormat that everybody walks over. It does not. That makes you a whole person who's living a happy life and being very productive. And all you have to do is get rid of that fear and get rid of that ego. 
And then you find out it's a really easy thing to do that. You don't have to force yourself. You know, it just is natural. It's just the way you are. So that's really where we want to go. So I guess the message here in reality is that you create that reality. Right. You're not stuck in it. You're not a victim of it. You're not trapped by it. You create it. And take responsibility for that creation. And if you don't like it, change yourself. Yeah. And change yourself to somebody who is a giving person. Don't care about what you get. Care about what you can give. Maximize your, your gift to others. And you'll find that you're a happy camper no matter what anybody else does. Your life is great. And on the other side, everybody around you will change and start acting very positively towards you. And they'll start thinking, I wonder what we can do for her, what we can do for him, because he's always there doing all the stuff for us, and they really start to appreciate you. You see? Rather than react to your grinding of teeth by them grinding their own teeth, and then the two of you going through life grinding your teeth at each other, and that's that's your whole life. Now you have you're in this world that sucks and that never works out right because your ego is struggling with somebody else's ego and your fear and their fear are in this uh, kind of wrestling competition, you know, who's going to dominate who. And, you know, a lot of people live their whole life that way. They, they come to an accommodation that, uh, you know, we'll have, we'll have the standoff of egos. Don't you press this buttons of mine and I won't press those buttons of yours. And we'll just learn to suck it up and live with it, even though neither one of us is very happy about it. And that's not a good way to live. You ought to be living in a joyful, happy place all the time. And it doesn't depend on other people and what they do. It just depends on you. So that's the thing. You have a happy, joyful reality right there. It's a probable reality of yours if you just make the right choices. And in order to make those right choices, you've got to get rid of that fear, get rid of that ego. Otherwise, it's hard to make those right choices. And in order to do that, you kind of look at yourself and say, yeah, I'm pretty self-focused. It is all about me and my wants and what I think is fair. And I just need to let all that stuff go and start working on it. And in two or three years, you'll probably have most of it worked off. It's not that hard. The hardest step is the first. The second step is a lot easier, and the third step is, is almost easy. So you just do it. This has been a great show, Tom. I this has been yeah, this has been a really great show. I know we've probably said a lot of the same things, but I don't know. Something made this sort of fall into place in a different way, and I have a feeling that I'm wanna, gonna want to explore dreams the next time. <laughs> that was information that I. I'm, I never heard before, and it just, I don't know, for whatever reason. I'm sure you've said it, but that was just different. So, Dreams are amazing. You can learn a lot from your dreams. and um, Who you are and the way the choices you make in that dream are really your choices and uh, the situations you get. And if you start paying attention to your dreams, you'll remember more of them. Right. And pretty soon, in uh, six months or so, if you're really focused on those dreams, you'll remember a lot of dreams every night. And they'll get more and more meaningful instead of just little trivial dreams. As, you know, I went up and flew around the clouds twice and came back down and didn't mean anything. You know, trivial dreams. You'll start getting more and more choices and more and more meaningful dreams the more attention that you pay to them. So we're going to talk about that next month. <laughs> about all the dreams you've had. Yeah, we'll do a little dream analysis. Do some dream analysis. Next month. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like fun. And anybody who has some interesting dreams and want to have, uh, want to hear our feedback on it, do uh, do email us and let us know. But thanks again, Tom. I I adore you. I think <laughs> how you put things into reference. I don't get to say a lot, which is you know easy for me. But uh, <laughs> I, I really I really do enjoy our shows. So to find out more about Tom, go to his website mybigtoe.com. He's got a forum, he's on YouTube, which has an extensive um, array of all sorts of videos and workshops that you can find out more information. So again, you've been listening to News of the Heart. We've been getting the heart of what matters. Thank you very much, Tom. You're welcome, Laurie. Thank you. Have a question for Laurie and want to be on the next News from the Heart show? Drop us a line via instant feedback at bmajor.org. 
News from the Heart is brought to you by Intuitive Soul and is produced by Major Radio for Clear Channel's iHeartRadio and BeMajor.org. 